So if we have a time course that we want to analyze, how does that tell us about the mechanism for how an enzyme is able to uh, do a certain reaction? And so we need to analyze this mathematically, but first we also need to take into consideration uh, if we've controlled for other factors. Uh, importantly, we know that enzymes, uh, as we discussed, uh, at least with protein ligand binding, we know that pH can have a great effect on the activity of a protein, or in this case, of an enzyme. And so the same sort of thing happens where if we have a rate, for instance, where rate is the velocity, how fast a reaction can occur by an enzyme, is going to be largely dependent on the pH. And so this might, these have pH optimums that then tail off at higher pHs. And so there are various reasons for that. One, if certain amino acids uh, that are protonatable <clears throat> have pKa's in a certain pH range, uh, we might expect that that protonation to be really important uh, for the activity of the enzyme. Uh, think back again to ligand binding, uh, for instance, where the pH is really critical in determining the, um, the where we think about the Bohr effect and how well O2 can bind uh, to hemoglobin, for instance. And so the same sort of thing can happen, and of course we have at the very extremes the protein denatures and is completely useless at, at really low or very high pHs. So pH can be a very critical factor, so we might have a pH optimum for an activity maybe at uh, pH 8 or 9 or something like that, right? Oops. So we have to remember then that when we're making a, um, when we're designing an experiment to look at the time dependence of product formation for an enzyme, uh, we need to be able to control, need to control pH. Oops. And of course, we need to control other factors that might have something to do uh, with the enzyme activity, including, uh, for instance, uh, the concentration of the reactants. And then another very critical thing, which we also know can lead to denaturation at the extremes, is temperature. And so we'll discuss more about the concentration of reactants very shortly. This is actually very important uh, in the design, in the experimental design for any of these experiments. Uh, and last, what we're going to discuss more in depth is we need to know, <coughs> so when we're looking at these data, let's back up. So when we look at these data, we need some sort of mathematical model to fit this. So again, think about uh, ligand binding, uh, and then we use hyperbolic fitting curves in order to determine the dissociation constant. Or we can use uh, a model that looks at cooperativity to figure out uh, both the dissociation constant, KD, and the Hill coefficient, N, uh, which lets us know, which gives us some information about the cooperativity between subunits and hemoglobin, for instance. Uh, we need to know really well in depth what assumptions are made when we make mathematical models, because a lot of times we make numerical assumptions uh, and if we make numerical assumptions in order to make the math easier so that the equation is easier to use in the end. But if our experimental uh, techniques, particularly the concentration of the reactants or the concentration of the enzyme, or more, specific, or more correctly, the relative concentrations of the two, aren't in line with the assumptions, uh, then we can fit, we may be able to fit a mathematical model to the data, uh, but it may not give us any reliable information. So we need to know the assumptions of the mathematical models. And we'll be discussing this and a lot of the mathematical models that help us interpret time-dependent data uh, in the next few videos.